Well, uh, I am Chris McEntee. I'm the Executive Director and CEO of, of the American Geophysical Union, the world's largest earth and space science scientific membership society, uh, with 60,000 members uh, from 138 countries around the world. And we are so pleased to be able to host this briefing. Um, one of the things that AGU we think does extremely well is to be a convener and we host briefings like this at our annual meeting every year, but this is an opportunity for us to expand our ability uh, to provide space uh, for discussions of this type. And it's extremely timely. This morning as I was coming into the office, I heard a great NPR story about one part of uh, potential budget proposals about cutting um, investment in scientific research and I think what um, you as journalists are going to hear today about the exciting work and the relevance of the work that really is funded and supported uh, by our federal government and why it's so important for the federal government to continue to invest um, in, this, in this research and um, to hear it in a very compelling um, and visual, uh, exciting um, way that also really says um, this is why we, we need further investment for good weather predictions, for knowing what's going on in our oceans, uh, for knowing uh, really whether we're going to have enough fish stock to be able to feed us um, and support a really healthy ecosystem and it goes on and on and on. So we are really delighted. We always like partnering with federal agencies and our member research scientists um, and um, I know we're going to get a lot of good information out of this. And with that, let me turn it over to Chris Sabine, um, who will start the panel, because the scientists here are really the ones with the story to tell. But thank you for choosing us, and we hope to do this more. All right. Thank you, Chris. So my name is, is uh, Christopher Sabine. I'm the director of the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory. We're, uh, in a NOAA Research Laboratory in Seattle, Washington. And as the organizer of this event, I just want to give a little bit of background on why we're here and, and what we've been doing. This is actually the uh, 11th NOAA Science Days briefing that we've done since 2012. And the idea is to uh, highlight the underpinnings behind how NOAA operates. So most people think of NOAA as more of an operational type agency doing uh, weather forecasting and, and, and opening and closing the fishing seasons. We do all of that, but underpinning all of that uh, more operational side of what NOAA does is uh, a very important and critical research component that um, the research that we do, uh, while it is kind of fundamental research, it's research that has a very practical and, and useful application to society and the economy. And we just wanted to, we like to highlight that frequently. And so this is our 11th uh, science days that we've had where we come out and just highlight a few aspects of, of the NOAA research that's being done and the, uh, the applications that that may have on for society and the economy. So with that, I don't want to take up more time. Thanks, I'll pass it back to Monica, and she can uh, introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to introduce all four of our speakers and give you a little bit of the, the, the lay of the land for today so you know when you know, you'll be able to ask questions, which we really, it's one of the high points of the, of the briefing. We love the questions. So um, we're going to have our four scientists give very brief presentations about their work. And then we're going to open it up to questions from the room and from our online audience. We have an online audience of somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or so journalists, so it's, 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 a, good, it's a good audience. And our speakers today, in this order, are Monica Youngman, who is a geodesist with NOAA's National Geodetic Survey, which is part of National Ocean Service, part of NOAA. And Monica is the project manager for NOAA's project to collect gravity measurements to improve the nation's elevation measurements to support future growth. Also, our next speaker will be Vincent Saba, and Vincent is a fisheries scientist at NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center, which is based in Woods Hole, but Vince works at our Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, which is our climate modeling lab in Princeton, New Jersey. And Vince is going to be speaking about uh, the 
what is happening to the Northeast ecosystem and how the warming of the waters and the ecosystem is changing where fish are now and in the future. And then we're going to have Lucas Harris, who is a physical scientist based at our NOAA Research's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton. And Lucas is going to be speaking about um, how we are advancing weather prediction and new tools that we are using to push our weather prediction out into a pioneering air area. And after him will be our last speaker, and that's Elizabeth Barnes, who is an assistant professor of atmospheric science at Colorado State University and is also a leader of NOAA's task force on subseasonal to seasonal weather prediction. And now, without further ado, I will, oh, also, just one, one quick thing. Um, on the, on the um, question and answer period, we ask that the reporters identify themselves and their outlet and then ask their question, both online and in person. That way, our scientists know where you're coming from geographically and have a little bit of a sense of your audiences. So now I'd like to turn this over to Monica Youngman. Great. Well, thank you for your interest in NOAA science. So my name is Monica Youngman, and I'm with the National Geodetic Survey, I'm part of the National Ocean Service of NOAA. So I'm going to be talking about how measuring gravity from an aircraft is going to form the foundation for future growth, supporting industries that save lives, protect property, and promote commerce. So we have a lot of geospatial data, or data that's related to position information and everything from land use cover to roads to photogrammetry. But all these things need to line up and work together to help this country answer um, all the different questions and problems that we have. So how do we make these things line up? Well, that's called geodetic control. So geodetic control is the foundation for all geospatial products. And this is what NGS, the National Geodetic Survey, defines is geodetic control. To use an analogy, think of a ruler. If you take measurements, they're only meaningful if you know where the zero point is. And that zero point, that's geodetic control, what we're defining. So think for a moment in terms of heights or elevations. If you think of the Earth, we could pick any zero point, And as long as we all agreed, everything would match up. So for heights or elevations, we could use an ellipsoid model, just a smooth surface approximating the shape of the Earth. And this is actually what GPS uh, measurements and observations use. But there's one problem with this system, and that's it has no relationship to what's happening on the Earth, specifically where water is going to flow. And that's critical for so many applications, particularly floodplain mapping. So going back to the Earth for a moment, Imagine it was covered in water. There is no land and no other forces like tides. What would the surface of that water look like? Well, it wouldn't be smooth. It would look something like this. And this surface would vary based on gravity. So where gravity was stronger, where there was higher density of the Earth, there would be a valley. And then where there was lower density and lower gravity value, there would be a peak. And if we use this surface, as a surface from which we measure heights or elevations from, then in that system we know water will always flow downhill and we'll be able to predict where water go, will go more accurately. And so how do we figure out where this surface is? How do we define that zero? Well, we need very accurate gravity data. And we have a lot of surface gravity data, so terrestrial measurements and marine measurements from ships. We also have a lot of satellite gravity measurements that are very good and accurate. So we have small features and big features, but we have a gap in the middle. And that's where measuring gravity from an aircraft comes in. So measuring airborne gravity can fill that gap between the satellite and the terrestrial measurements, as well as cover areas like the coastal zones very efficiently. So NGS, uh, started a project to collect airborne gravity for the entire US and territories. And this has never been done before. So there's a lot of uh, research that has gone in to making this uh, work for the entire country on, on a very large scale. So we started this project back in 2008, and we're now uh, over 60% complete with covering the country. And so we're targeting uh, fi over 15.6 million square kilometers covering the contiguous US Alaska, Hawaii, and American Samoa. 
And we started by trying to focus on the areas with greatest need, namely Alaska and the coastal areas. Um, but by 2022, we will have covered the entire uh, US. And so what does this mean moving into the future? So this is uh, our best estimate today of how heights will change in the future. And, and this isn't a physical change in the land. This is just redefining our zero point, and so just redefining those height or elevation measurements. And so in the contiguous US, there's up to, or over four feet of change in some locations, and in Alaska, over seven feet of change in some locations. And I will emphasize that this is a big deal for Alaska because our current system um, has relied on very sparse ground data because it's very difficult to get on the ground across the state of Alaska. But with the airborne gravity data, we're able to cover the state of Alaska very efficiently uh, and have a consistent data set for the first time for the entire state. And so all of these changes, uh, what does this actually mean for the US? Well, there's this a independent socioeconomic benefit study back in 2009 that determined that this project uh, once complete, will provide $4.8 billion in benefits over 15 years uh, to the nation, primarily through improvements uh, in floodplain mapping. In addition, that study cited that the surveying and mapping industry is a $4.9 billion industry and supports up to 200,000 surveying-related jobs. But even beyond the surveying and mapping industry, this uh, positioning system is going to touch so many different applications and industries. So floodplain mapping is the obvious one, but also uh, transportation infrastructure development. So construction of pipelines uh, over regional scales or continental scales and uh, rail development uh, will be impacted by this, uh, as well as precision agriculture. And then in coastal zones, it's very important to know where your water is going to go for storm surge modeling and uh, for conservation planning. So there's so many different applications and industries uh, that will benefit from this uh, basic uh, foundation. So in conclusion, measuring gravity down will provide the foundation for a new vertical reference system that will support industries that save lives, protect property, and promote commerce. This project is the first time that the US will have an airborne gravity data set uh, for the entire country and will support industries um, that will really benefit uh, the nation uh, into the future. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks folks, my name is Vince Saba, I work for NOAA Fisheries. And so today I'm gonna to talk about how we're assessing climate change impacts on the U.S. Northeast Continental Shelf. So shown here is the U.S. Northeast Continental Shelf. It goes from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, up through the Gulf of Maine. We also share some waters with the Canadians, which we call the Scotian Shelf, over here just north of Georgia's bank. But what you can see from this figure is that the majority of the U.S. shelf is relatively shallow, just under about 300 feet. This is where most of the fishing takes place. And this happens globally. Most fishing takes place in very shallow shelf regions because they're relatively productive. So in terms of um, economic value of, of the U.S. Northeast shelf, if we look at a, a, a map here of the major U.S. fishing ports throughout the entire U.S., including Hawaii and Alaska, what you can see is that the large black circles represent the major ports, and the larger those circles are, the more valuable they are on an annual basis. So New Bedford, Massachusetts is the most valuable port across the entire U.S. In 2015, it brought in $322 million uh, worth of catch, commercial catch. The reason why it's so valuable is because three quarters of that catch comes from sea scallops. Sea scallops are a very valuable uh, species. Just to put in perspective, Dutch Harbor, which catches actually more fish in terms of weight, is less valuable at 218 million. So throughout the U.S. Northeast Shelf, it's a relatively small system, but it, it, it hosts the, the most productive ports, um, some of the most productive ports across the U.S. So what does the Northeast Shelf look like over the past 30 years or so in terms of warming? So the top figure here shows the Gulf of Maine in terms of the ocean surface temperature measured by satellites, and the bottom figure here shows globally what those temperature anomalies look like um, over the past 10 years. So what you can see is a 30, 35 year time series, and then the red line here demonstrates what that time series looks like over just the last 10 years here. And so 
what we've observed is that the Gulf of Maine over the last 10 years has warmed faster than 99% of the global ocean. And this was published in Science in 2015 by Pershing et al. And so the warming rate here is faster than most regions, both coastally and also in pelagic regions around the globe. It's a very uh, hot spot for warming. So what does this mean for fish? So our NOAA survey data goes out in the fall and spring every year, and we have a bottom trawl that sweeps the entire northeast shelf, George's Bank, the Gulf of Maine, and we've been <clears throat> measuring fish abundance since the 1960s. And what we've seen is we've seen dramatic shifts in where fish were in the earlier parts of the surveys and where we're catching them today. So this is showing one of our cold water species, Atlantic cod. And what you can see by the figure on the right is that the probability of catching cod is greater at colder bottom ocean temperatures. And so what our survey data has shown that as time progresses, not only are we seeing less and less cod due to multiple factors like overfishing, species competition, but we're seeing them also move to the north. So less cod and they're on their move to the north based on our survey data. So in order to assess climate change packs on regional uh, spots like the U.S. Northeast Shelf, we do rely on global climate models, of which are developed at uh, the NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. So we rely on these global models which simulate the Earth's climate in order to assess regional impacts. We have to use these global models. And basically what they do is they're a series of complex equations that try to simulate Earth's climate. You can take that one step further and add chemistry and biology and actually simulate ocean productivity, land vegetation change, and things like that. But what I'll be talking about today are the physical components of our climate models. So for the U.S. Northeast Shelf, if we take a, a zoom in from a global climate model, we look at observed ocean temperature here on the top left, and then the far, the, the uh, top right, is what we call a coarse or low resolution climate model, which are the standard global models that are used by the IPCC every six to seven years or so. Well, now NOAA has developed high resolution global climate models to help with these regional analyses, which we know are important, especially for fish. So these bottom two panels, so a, these are two prototype NOAA models that have a higher resolution ocean component. So we can actually resolve features like where the Gulf Stream should be, where the Labrador current should be. And what you can see is that when you go high res, if you look at the top right figure, you don't get the Gulf Stream where it should be, but the higher res models do resolve those circulation, um, those circulation features. So what does that look like for projected warming? Well, the top two panels here show low resolution projections under a doubling of atmospheric, atmospheric CO2 over 70 to 80 years. The bottom two panels show high resolution projections under the same atmospheric CO2 uh, scenario. And what you can see is that in the lower resolution climate models, these are all NOAA models, you get uniform warming throughout the US, or U.S. eastern seaboard. But when you go to high res, we see non-uniform warming, such that the Gulf of Maine warms faster than the rest of the U.S. northeast shelf. And the reason for that is because more Gulf Stream water penetrates into the Gulf of Maine with climate change in the model. So what does that mean for cold water fish like cod, uh, which are Atlantic cod are one of the oldest uh, commercial fisheries in the U.S., going back to the 1600s. What we can see is that when we take the high-res model from NOAA and we combine it with a cod thermal habitat model, what you're seeing is less and less available bottom thermal habitat for cold water fish like cod, so that by the time CO2 doubles in the model run, we virtually have no Atlantic cod left in the U.S. Northeast Shelf because these fish are already at the southern end of their range. What you can see by this table here is that cod are a very valuable fish throughout the U.S., most of which are caught now in the Pacific, not coming from the Atlantic because there's not much left. So if we look at other species that are caught in our survey data, and we can look at the open circles where their center of biomass is being caught today, and the closed solid circles where the high-res NOAA model projects where they'll be caught 50, 60 to 100 years from now, we can see changes relative to where the major ports are along the U.S. Uh, eastern seaboard, the northeast shelf. And one thing I want to note of caution is that these projections don't account for changes in fishing uh, behavior in terms of fishing mortality. It doesn't account for new species interactions. This is just looking at thermal habitat uh, for, these, for these particular critters. And so in the green we're showing croaker, which are a less valuable fish. So you can see croaker on the move to the north. Summer flounder, which are kind of in the middle. So they're now closer. You can see summer flounder now closer to New London and New Bedford. And then lobster in the purple. And now you can see lobster in the center of biomass is now closer to uh, Newington and Portland. So in some cases, some of these ports might be closer to more valuable species. In other cases, these ports now might be close to less valuable species. And so we have to consider how fishermen are going to change their gear, uh, fuel costs, and things like that as these fish are moving. Because already in our observations, we're seeing substantial northern shifts and even some southern shifts in some of these particular uh, commercial species. So in summary, 
The U.S. Northeast Shelf accounts for just over a third of the annual value of commercial fish throughout the U.S., a very productive area. In addition, the U.S. Northeast Shelf has warmed faster uh, than most uh, re uh, coastal regions globally over the last 10 years, particularly in the Gulf of Maine. NOAA's new high-res climate model, it resolves the enhanced warming, what we're seeing in the observations today. It also resolves the local circulation, where the Gulf Stream should be, where the Labrador Current should be. The reason why we don't have a lot of these models around the world today is because they're very expensive to run and they're computationally intensive. They require lots of computers strung together and they require money to, to, to run them. We also expect continued distribution shifts under continued warming. So our survey data go out, they go out every year and we're, we're, we're still observing these shifts. And our goal is to basically, we, we fall under the umbrella of the recently published NOAA Fisheries Climate Science Strategy, which came out last year. And we were tasked to have regional action plans to go ahead and continue our research to assess climate change impacts on commercial and species. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas Harris. I represent the uh, FE Cubed team at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey. I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, thing that's in the news a lot, FE3 or FE Cubed, as we call it. I'll describe what exactly that stands for, what it means, and why it's important for uh, NOAA and uh, broader uh, weather and climate modeling purposes. So uh, there's a lot of dynamical cores out there, including many just here in the United States. So what makes FV cubed stand out from the rest of the crowd? So I'll give you a couple of reasons. One is that FV cubed is renowned around the world for the quality of the way that it moves, uh, that it moves around things like moisture and heat and pollution by the wind, something we call transport. In fact, FV cubed got to start as the transport part of a air pollution model in the 90s. And, did so, and was so good at what it did that it led a revolution in, chemistry, in air pollution modeling at that time. It's still renowned around the world for how well, it, uh, how well its accuracy and its efficiency is at transport. FE cubed is also designed to do an excellent job representing rotating or spinning motions in the atmosphere. This is important because critical weather systems like the polar vortex, like hurricanes, like severe thunderstorms, and like tornadoes are all rotating motions. And FE cube is designed from day one to be as fast as possible without compromising the scientific integrity of the system that it's simulating. So as we're all aware, time is money, and uh, we, we have, uh, yeah, the taxpayers have paid a lot of money for the computing systems that we have at NOAA, and even then we still have a computing crunch. So uh, having a fast model that uses a fast dynamical core allows us to take the best advantage of the computing systems that we have. So what exactly is this thing, FE cube? And so I want to, so, I want to talk about a little bit about what exactly this thing means. FE cubed is short for the finite volume cubed sphere dynamical core, and I'll describe in turn what each of those things mean. A dynamical core is a software component of a weather or climate model that acts sort of as the, as the engine or the heart of such a model. It's the part that takes the continuous equations describing air motion and, and such, and then breaks them down in a way a computer can understand to solve for the pressure and the winds and how, how the winds move stuff around. It is a finite volume dynamical core, which refers to the ways that the equations are broken down. What we do is we take the atmosphere and divide it into a whole bunch of blocks, which we call our finite volumes. And then we use a physically motivated way of figuring out how much air is going in between each of the blocks and how the different blocks are pushing on one another, the different pressure forces on one another. It is a cubed sphere dynamical core, which refers to the way that our finite volumes are laid out on the face of the Earth. What we do is we take a cube, we draw a grid on each one of the six faces of the cube, and then project that out onto the sphere of the Earth. And that layout allows us to better take advantage of, of modern supercomputing systems that have a lot of redundant individual computer processors. And also gives us the capability to zoom in on individual weather systems, such as severe thunderstorms or hurricanes. And I do want to point out that it is just a dynamical core. And it is an important component of every, any weather or climate model, but it is just a dynamical core. It's not a complete model itself. It's only the part, or it only takes care of the parts of the atmosphere and of the climate system circled with the orange, orange lines here. And it need, a complete model would need a lot more things, things like uh, sunshine, like heat radiation, clouds precipitation processes, land, oceans, and ice to be a complete model useful for weather forecasting or climate simulation. Here's a couple of examples of forecasts. I mean, these buzzwords are nice, but nobody cares if you can't do a better forecast or a better climate simulation. 
Here's an example of forecast skill compared to the current NOAA global forecast model. And so above the black line means that you're doing better than the current NOAA global model. And certainly we know that the European Center's weather forecast model, which is the best in the world, does quite a bit better than the current NOAA forecast model. But the model that our team is developing, the prototype based on FV cubed, already is halfway towards meeting that sort of skill. So we've already gotten the ball rolling on being, getting a second to none weather forecasting system. Now this is just one measure of forecast skills. This is a very large, like global scale of how well you're doing, kind of a general purpose metric. But people are interested in how well it does at high impact weather events, such as hurricanes, for instance. And here's one example. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see uh, plots, plots the error in forecasting the changes in the strength or intensity of a hurricane. So lower values are better. You can see in the blue line, this is actually the best model in the world. This Blue line is the best model in the world for forecasting hurricane intensity. And it turns out NOAA has developed this model, model, model ourselves. Uh, this NOAA model is a very specialized model for forecasting just hurricane intensity, and it does a better job than anyone else in the world. But you can take a look at the prototype that our team has developed, and you can see that we can match the skill with our general purpose global model already with just with, with the way that we've set up things already. We're already matching this, the skill and forecasting intensity changes. And this opens up a big gateway to being even better when we start to specialize guys, towards the things that the specialized model does. And lastly, I want to mention a last application of uh, severe th storms forecasting, in which uh, we zoom in over the continental United States and we can do forecasts. Here's one example, a three-day forecast of the uh, Moore tornado outbreak in uh, 2013 that included the incredible EF5 tornado that struck Moore, Oklahoma. And you can see that in our case we're able to well simulate this very long line of uh, severe thunderstorms as well as the individual thunderstorms that caused the severe weather that day. Finally, I want to acknowledge the team that's put a lot of hard work into making these results possible. In particular, I want to acknowledge uh, S.J. Lynn in the middle there. Uh, he's been called the uh, weather master lately. As well as the rest of the team that's put in so much of their, so much work to be able to make these model results possible. And finally, I want to mention how we're working with people, a number of teams both inside and outside of NOAA, to be able to take this mod, the models we're already starting to develop in the cube and turn them into second, a second to none weather forecasting system that America deserves. So, thank you. Um, thank you all for giving me a chance to talk to you today about some exciting work um, going on by the, uh, both by my group at Colorado State University, but also I'm lead of the NOAA task force on sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction. And I'm going to tell you about, I'll give you an overview of the exciting work that's being done by this group. All right, so the butterfly effect. It's been in a few movies lately, I know. Um, the idea of chaos, or as the father of chaos theory said, the idea that when a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, this might actually set off a, a in this case, a tornado in Texas. So this idea that tiny little differences, one part of the globe, could cause big, big differences somewhere else. Now why is that important for today's discussion? Well, when you think about weather modeling or, or weather forecasting, the further in time you go out or you want to know what the weather is, the harder and harder it is. And this is that a butterfly effect coming into play. So after about 10 days to two weeks, the butterfly effect takes over, and it's really hard to tell you exactly what's going to happen to the weather. Now on longer time scales, say three months to seasons, we actually can take advantage, advantage of information within the ocean, like El Nino or La Nina, to tell us what the weather might be doing. But if you've noticed, in the middle here, there's this gap. And this gap we call the sub-seasonal to seasonal gap. And the question is, what do we do there? How can we predict the weather or weather extremes in this time frame? And so today I want to tell you a little bit about how this task force, the Subseasonal to Seasonal Prediction Task Force, is working together to try and build little pieces of a bridge to fill this gap. And I want to tell you about how some approaches we're taking to doing this to attacking this problem. So first, <coughs> before I do that though, you might say, why do I care about this gap? Okay, so let's think about the types of things we do on these different time scales. So in terms of weather, thinking seven days or so, this is when FEMA is planning evacuation routes. This is when the National Weather Service is issuing weather watches and warnings. On this longer time scale, this is where, um, of the seasonal, so three months and beyond, this is when commercial shipping in the Arctic is being planned, or people are thinking about the futures market and, and hedging. But it's in the middle here that actual shipping routes throughout most of the oceans are being determined. 
This is when um, there's pre-staging of emergency supplies to be ready for when that next disaster strikes. This is when reservoir operators are trying to decide, should I let water out or should I keep water in my reservoir? And when uh, farmers are deciding, hey, should I plant my seeds or should I wait a few more weeks? All right, so knowing what the weather is going to be in this time frame of two weeks to two months out is really important for society. So how do we do this? So in a nutshell, you can really think about where are we going to get this information about what the weather is going to do? I told you about the butterfly effect. So where are we going to get the info? And the answer is we can look one of really four places. We can look up into the upper atmosphere, what we call the stratosphere. There's information there that can tell us about the weather in the future. We can look down at the surface of the earth, both at the land and the ocean. It holds information. But we can also look north to the Arctic, and we can look south to the tropics. And I want to give you three quick examples of how we look in these four different directions and how scientists right now are working at looking in these four different directions to how we can build this bridge or, or get this information. So my first example is going to look at atmospheric rivers. So can we predict atmospheric rivers two weeks to two months out? Now atmospheric rivers are, what are they? Um, they're these narrow plumes of moisture in our atmosphere that from a satellite image can look a lot like a river. In this case, a big river hitting Southern California on February 7th of this year. Um, they carry a lot of water up to 15 Mississippi rivers, if you will. They can cause damage. Uh, on average, a one and a half billion dollars per year along the U.S. West Coast, but they can also bring much needed water, pro um, providing 25 to 50 percent of the western water supply. So an example of the types of damage in this case that these atmospheric rivers can do, this is a picture of the damage Orville Dam spillway at the end of February of this year. Um, and this in part was due to the large amount of water that fell in the region due to multiple atmospheric rivers, including the one on the right I show, I've shown you here, um, hitting the area. And so the idea is how can we predict these events two weeks to two months in advance so, for example, reservoir operators have the information they need to make decisions. I do want to point out quickly, though, that atmospheric rivers are not just important for California. They also impact Alaska and the Midwest United States, and I'm happy to talk about that more later if you're interested. So in my group, we're actually studying these atmospheric rivers, and what we do is we look up into the stratosphere for information, and we look south to the tropics. And it turns out using information from the winds in the stratosphere and from the clouds and the rain in the tropics along the equator, we are, it's looking like we're able to predict whether, um, or the probability of these events occurring uh, at least 30 days ahead of time. Now another example is looking down. Where are we going to get this information in two weeks to two months of the weather? And we can look down to the surface of the earth. And this, when I say knowledge of the land surface, I mean, is there snow? Is the, is the dirt wet? Um, how hot is the dirt? Knowing that information can actually give us um, or extend, in this case, skillful forecasts of air temperature. So knowing what the air temperature will be in two weeks to two months time frame can actually give us extra warning up to about 15 <coughs> days, which is critical for predicting drought and heat waves. And finally, um, another, other groups in the task force are looking at the stratospheric polar vortex. So this is a region of air, of fast moving air, up in the stratosphere, but over the pole. So looking to the Arctic, looking up and north. And uh, members of the group are looking at how this stratospheric polar vortex can give us information about persistent high weather, uh, persistent weather patterns um, that affect the weather where we live. For example, causing persistent heat waves, uh, causing a lot of snow to get dumped on the same region, so snowmageddon and snowpocalypse were related to these persistent weather patterns. Um, Hurricane Sandy itself was actually steered large, in large part into the East Coast because of one of these persistent weather pattern sitting off of Greenland, rather than Sandy going out into the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, this, oh, this is cut off, that's NOAA there. Uh, the NOAA task force um, is really, work, we're working to bridge this gap in this two weeks to two month time frame. And this group is made up of 59 scientists, both within NOAA and outside of NOAA. And we're all working on different pieces of this puzzle or of this bridge to extend skillful weather predictions out into this two week to two month time frame. Thank you.